Good morning. I love it when Colin stands up at the front and he says, it's nice just to hear the gentle hush of everyone coming in. And I just stand there and everyone just carries on like normal. <laughs> and he's obviously got this air of authority about him when you think he's in the room, then we need to quieten down. And you look at me and just think, oh, well, he, he can wait. But it's good to see you this morning. A warm welcome to Grimsby Baptist Church on a, uh, well, it was wet. It probably is going to be later. We've got thunderstorms on the way. A uh, bit of an indifferent day, a bit of a strange day. But it is warm in here and we're meeting together to praise and to worship the Lord together. So you are all welcome. A few notices before we do that. Uh, the first one is that at the back there's a new notice sheet that Brenda's produced. So uh, if you want to get one of them, that will or should be. I don't think it's gone out already on email, has it? Yeah. Where's your... It has gone out an email. Well done. Someone, there you go. You check your emails. Well done. That's fantastic. But if you haven't got emails, then please do grab one of them. Just let you know what's happening. And one of the things that's happening is the church meeting, which is on June the 12th, where we'll be including the election of elders and deacons. So please do that. Have that in your diary on June the 12th at 7.30. It'll be good to see you there. And next Sunday morning, anyone know what's happening next Sunday morning? Where's Amelia? Is she in? Fun run. Yeah. Fun run is about 3K, I think. This is a 10K race, yeah. It's the Grimsby 10K, and different roads are going to be closed around Grimsby. So just think about what time you leave and how you get here and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, because it's going to just cause a little bit of upset because it's right through the time when we'll be meeting in the mornings. I know Scatherow's closed between 8 and 10, um, so I'll have to find a different way here and different things. So you may have to do the same, so remember that. And then also, uh, next Saturday, we've been uh, talking about this for a few weeks now, we know, but next Saturday... At two o'clock, it's David's Thanksgiving service. David Jones just round the corner at City Church, so all welcome to uh, come to that. And then afterwards, back here uh, for um, a bring and share lunch. So please do uh, have that in your diary. And if you're not coming, you can't make it, or don't feel that you, you, you knew him that well. And then do be praying for the family this week as we head towards that time uh, together. Okay, I think that's it as far as notices go. Is that anything else anyone needs to say? I could be here all morning, can't we? What a dangerous thing to say that is. Yeah, no, don't do that. Yeah, Heather's like, move on, move on. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Um, so let's read a psalm together, shall we? A few verses of a psalm just to concentrate our minds and thoughts and remind ourselves of why we're here. Psalm 65 says, God, our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who form the mountains by your power, Having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. So let's stand together, shall we, and praise our great God together. Yeah, let's praise and glorify our God.
we stray away from God. His love just draws us back to him because he has given us Jesus and through his blood, our sins have been cancelled. Right, so our wise word of today is tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. I wanted to say a joke at this point, but I was told by my wife that I couldn't because it wouldn't be funny. So you don't have to come back tomorrow to find out the wise word. So can I have... Thank you. <laughs> can I have three volunteers, please? And I need one of them who celebrated a 50th birthday in the last two days. Anybody know... Anybody? Oh, it's you, Katrina. <laughs> Sorry, who else is my other two? Amelia, yeah, do you want to come up? And Jackson, did you put, you put your hand straight up there, Jackson? Thank you. 
Okay, so tell me, what are you doing this time tomorrow? Oh, it's a bank holiday, isn't it? Um, well, if I'm not in bed still, which I doubt very much, um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to, well, I've, I'm not at work, so that's wonderful. So I think tomorrow I will be, I don't know, I might go into town, might do a bit of cleaning. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, any offers on cake anywhere? Coffee? I'm always up for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I hear you've yeah. got quite a bit of cake quite to eat though at the moment, yeah. I think. Um, wow, so you've not quite got your plan sorted yet. Amelia, you've had a little bit more time to think about it. Do you know what you're doing at this time tomorrow? I'll probably be sleeping. Sleeping at 10th? At this time? Yeah. Goodness me. OK, right. Jackson. Trying to wake my mum up. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure she'll appreciate you sharing that with everybody. Um, anybody got anything more exciting than that that they want to share? Oh, we're all quite boring here today. I know. Oh, so no, there is somebody. What are you doing this time tomorrow? You're watching TV downstairs. That is, well, it depends on what you're watching. I'm sure it's very exciting. So let's read the proverb that we've got to go with that. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what tomorrow may bring. So I don't think the Bible's telling us that we shouldn't make plans for tomorrow. What the Bible is telling us is that we should have perspective on our plans for tomorrow and the next day and, of course, the future. So can anybody here... Put your hand up if every single plan that you've made for the future, for the next day, the week after, the next month, has always gone according to plan, with nothing ever going wrong or something <laughs> unexpected happening. Nobody. Wow. Of course, we know that plans change, don't we? We know that unexpected things happen. Sometimes people let us down. Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes things just don't turn out as we expect them to. And that sometimes can happen when it comes to presents, can't it? So, okay, thank you for waiting patiently. So I've got some presents for you guys. Now, here's the first one. Jackson, can you tell me, what do you think that present might be? Maybe like a blanket. Oh, you, you, you're very clever. You can feel it, can't you? have not just seen it, you've felt it, yes. But somebody said it looks a little bit like a football. So let's see what it, see what it is. A tea towel. Yeah, you've always wanted some of them, haven't you? <laughs> You might have to blame my wife for that. <laughs> but I know there is something in there, yes. <laughs> ah, so it is a football. But it's not really a football, is it? What is it? It's a piggy bank. It's a piggy bank. Well done. So, yes, it looked a little bit like a football, but it wasn't really a proper football. OK, Amelia, how old are you? Ten. Ten. <laughs> Your parents are here, aren't they? OK. That's fine. What do you think that might be? A candle. Oh, very clever. But what does it maybe look like a little bit more obviously? Because this, this illustration might not work if you don't give me the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, maybe a bottle of wine? Could be an explosive. <laughs> <laughs> or an explosive. Right, so let's, um, let's see what it is. But I'm going to stand back while you open it. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's not really very good, is it? Let's be honest. I think you'd be quite disappointed if you got that as a present. Yes, it looked a little bit like a bottle of wine, but it wasn't. However, this is... Now, I hear on the grapevine that uh, you have a phone which is incredibly old, so old that people um, laugh at you for that. Is that true? It was. It was true. Oh, you've got an, a new one. Oh, well, I'll take it back then. <laughs> An 
iPhone. <laughs> says it's not only is it an iPhone, it's an iPhone 15. I would oh, say, you know, it's a brand. Did you not? Oh, nice. Wow. Okay. Nice. See. Oh. Oh, who did that? That's not very kind, is it? I know. Oh. Well, thank you so much for being my guinea pigs and for helping me to illustrate. Give me a round of applause. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry, yes. <laughs> Diet tomorrow. That was the... <laughs> what happens tomorrow? Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. You will see me in a bit, Jackson, absolutely. Right, uh, Jackson's coming to my house for lunch. Just saying that. That's, <laughs> that's what's happening. <laughs> Um, right, so, did what you get as a pre present, did it turn out to be what you got in reality? Of course it didn't, and our plans don't turn out like we want them to sometimes. But do you know there is one person whose plans always turn out exactly like they plan? They never become surprised, there's nothing unexpected happens, who knows the end? from the beginning. And of course, that is God, as we read in Psalm 33, 11, which is going to come up for us. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of, heart, of his heart through all generations. God's plans never change. His plans for us never change either. But it isn't like God gives us a plan and then just leaves us to get on with it, does he? He's so wonderful that he comes and he shows us and he teaches us how we should think about the plans that we make tomorrow and the next day. But he also knows that when we think about tomorrow and we think about the next day and we think about next month or next year, that very often what we think about is, is quite anxious thoughts because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know everything that's going to happen to us. But very wonderfully, Jesus helps us and teaches us how we should think about that. And he gives us a great example of that in this story that Isaac's going to come up and read from us in the Bible. Um, good morning. Um, this passage is from Luke chapter 12, verse 13, and it's the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, because is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. That's great. So if Jesus is warning about how foolish it is if we 
that our anxieties lead us to put all of our trust in things and wealth and riches and savings and pensions. He's tenderly calling upon us to think about all of the evidence around us every day that we see how God cares for all of his creation from the smallest part of it and to remember that and trust in him for that. And then he teaches us how we should make plans for tomorrow and for the next day and for the day after that. Building treasure in heaven. Treasure that will never be taken away, never be stolen, and that will be there for eternity. Treasure which, which comes from a heart that trusts in Jesus and wants to please him and make plans which do his will and for his glory. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that we know that tomorrow is in your hands and we can trust you completely. Help us when we're anxious and we're fearful about what the future holds. Help us to live a life which is thankful and praising of you and all that you've done and trusts you and builds treasure which lasts forever. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing our next song, which is Mighty, Mighty Saviour. And the children will leave at the end of this song. Thank you. And of course, we can be sure for yesterday, today and tomorrow that Jesus is our mighty saviour. I think we've got a couple of helpers to come and do this as well. Here we go. A couple of children. <clears throat>
Okay. We'll pray for them as they've gone out. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's come before God in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning, having sung your praises, we lift our hearts to you. And we thank you for your faithfulness and steadfast love, your mercy and your grace. We see these things supremely at the cross as the Lord Jesus gave himself for us. We thank you that he has opened up the way to you for us and that we can come through him. Forgive us, Lord, for our sin, for those acts and thoughts that lead us away from you rather than towards you. Have mercy on us, Lord, we pray, and help us to honour you in the way that we live and think and speak. Help us to grow to be more like Jesus, we ask, in his character and faithfulness. That our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Father, we do thank you for those young people who have been in this morning and have now gone out to their classes. We pray that you would speak into their lives. We pray that you'd be with their teachers. We pray that you'd help them to understand <clears throat> how important Jesus is and what is done for them. Open their hearts and minds, Lord, we pray as they look at your word together. We also think of all those who are going through exams, Lord. We pray at uh, this particularly stressful time that you would be with them. And we pray that they would get rest this coming week as it's half term. Uh, just be able to brush up on uh, revision and different things but also just take that time to relax i know many of them have got many exams and we pray that you would help them as they deal with sometimes the first real uh, amount of stress in their lives help them to know that you are there and that they can look to you and trust you in this time we pray we do thank you lord for the work of the christian institute and for their visit here this week and for all that they're involved in and we ask for continued wisdom and strength for them we particularly pray for James and Nathan who came and spoke to us. We pray for them in the challenges that they face. We thank you for their literature and for the ways in which they seek to help us to understand these challenging issues. Protect them, Father, we pray. And we also pray, Lord, for Saturday, for the service of thanksgiving for David. Particularly pray for Ian and Jenny and Katie and Sarah and Sophie and Leo, but all those who are close to him, those who are missing him dearly. We pray in some ways, Lord, that that service would help them. And we ask that you would draw near to them in your grace. We also pray for wisdom in our up and coming church members meeting, that you will guide us as a church and that you will continue to use us for your purposes and glory and for the extension of your kingdom. And let's pray together, shall we? Let's end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again before Gary comes to read to us from God's Word, and then Jeremy comes to speak to us. Thank you. Let's stand together.
There are two readings this morning. The first is a very short one and continues our series in the Beatitudes. And it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And if you're using a church Bible, that's on page 968. And then the second reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16 on page 1179 of the church Bible. So Matthew 5... Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. 
Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessings to you this morning. Good morning. Hope you're all well in the Lord as we come uh, before his word. Could I have the first slide up, Stevie? Bless you. Thank you. One of Jude and I's very favorite programs is one that's run a series over the past two or three years called Surgeons at the Edge of Life. I don't know whether you've watched it or not. Quite frankly, it's a bit graphic as you see people being opened up and worked on. You can't watch it, by the way, if you are squeamish in any way. I mean, there are bits of it that we watch, you know, sort of through our fingers or closed eyes, you know, behind the settee, as it were, because some bits are really quite, quite graphic. The programme is about how gifted surgeons push the boundaries of surgical science, in order to save lives. It demonstrates to us procedures that we wouldn't have even thought possible uh, a few years ago. They are amazing. And both Jude and I are struck by the facts that we're not only beautifully and wonderfully made, But all these complex surgeries are focused around keeping the patient alive and keeping their heart pumping despite the operation and the trauma that that causes on their bodies. Even when they're doing heart surgery, uh, they give them a temporary heart to keep the blood flowing because uh, without all that, the patient will, of course, die. And even when doing other complex surgeries, where they are operating next to major blood vessels, they are extremely careful. And their focus is not to cause catastrophic blood loss, because that again will cause the heart to arrest, and again, the patient will die. It seems that the heart is the centre of us both existing and surviving. They can even survive in those very tragic circumstances when even in a coma and being brain dead, the body can still exist. The heart is the centre of our working body. That's why health experts are always on about us keeping a healthy heart. Of course, the Bible, in referring to the heart in these cases, is not referring to that vital muscle that pumps the blood around our bodies, as we've just thought about, but the very essence of our being, the very center of who we are and from which we function, our soul, as it were. I guess that's why it's used in these biblical analogies. So before we come to God's word, let's pray and ask for God's help as we come to his word. Father, as we come to your word this morning, what we don't know teaches, what we have not givers, and what we are not makers. All for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
If we could have the next slide up, Steve. There is a quote by Oswald J. Smith that is used in our Christianity Explored course, and it is this. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And as Jeremiah the prophet wrote in chapter 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So if the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart, and the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, we have got a little bit of a problem, haven't we? Because, as our beatitude says, because it means we cannot see God. So this morning, if we look together, firstly, together at the problem and the solution, then where we stand, our standing before God... And then what seeing God now and in the future might look like in the working out of the biblical truths that we're going to be looking at. So first of all, let's look at the problem and the solution. Well, the problem, of course, starts in Genesis 3, doesn't it? When tempted by evil desire and an unguarded heart, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes were open to their nakedness, that exposure and understanding of embarrassment and shame. And as we are talking about seeing God, what did they do? They hid, didn't they? They hid from God. Quite significant, I think, I would suggest. And then they continue and start telling lies and playing the blame game. And so this battle of sinful desire and consequences begins and plagues our human condition. It stains human hearts and indeed all creation. G.K. Chesterton, the author and, and founder of you know, Father Brown and Sister Boniface, you may have read the books, you may have seen it on the telly, understood this, he understood it. And when asked what was wrong with the world, his answer was, I am. This brings to mind Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. But God, and they are two, the, one of the most precious two word phrases in the Bible, but God had made a plan before the foundation of the earth. A plan to reconcile or redeem a sinful people back into a relationship with himself through the saving work of the Lord Jesus at Calvary. A foretaste was was written much earlier by the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36, verse 25, where he writes, and this is God speaking, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart a heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. See, as New Testament believers, we see the working out of this plan in the Lord Jesus going to the cross to pay that sin debt for us. And from only just last week, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling all believers. So because of that, let's look at our standing before God. You see, Jesus, he was that perfect sacrifice So the wrath of our utterly holy God could be satisfied and we could be declared innocent just as in a court of law. Because of Jesus, we can be declared to have a right standing before God. We are justified. And our justification, as the Bible tells us, is by faith alone. It states it very clearly at the first two chapters of the beginning of Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we can have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. In other words, we are saved by simply believing in him and on his saving work on the cross, believing that the gospel is true. And at that point, and totally believing that it is true, we are born again. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Now, isn't that utterly wonderful and mind-blowing that those of us who know Jesus can declare we are a new creation in him? It helps us meditate on those words of Ezekiel. We are given a new regenerate heart and God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us to empower us to live for him. The other thrilling thing is that a regenerate heart only wants to run away from sin and towards God. That is repentance. However, an unregenerate heart will only want to run from God. Like most of the world out there, God and Jesus becomes an offence or an indifference. As Christians... When the Lord Jesus drank the cup of wrath on the cross and paid that huge sin date, do you know, something marvellous happened. An exchange took place. He took our sin, but he also gave us his righteousness. We have a right standing before God because of Christ's righteousness. We are declared righteous and justified. Because we're still living in a broken and frustrated creation, until the Lord Jesus returns, our righteousness is wholly dependent on Christ because God sees Jesus' heart. So because of Christ's heart, ours is declared pure also. Reality is, we stand rightly before a holy God because we are justified by faith alone nothing we should do nothing we can do simply by faith alone as an unearned free gift alone that's grace alone all understood through god's word so it's according to the scriptures alone and yes all for god's glory alone that is simply Wonderful. And as a further encouragement this morning, there's those words that Peter wrote in his first epistle in chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. That is our salvation. So let's take a moment or two to think about the outworking of that, how that works. Even though we know our standing before God is of a pure heart, that is not how we are operating today, is it? We still sin, and if we really think about it, we know the depths of depravity that our own hearts can sink to. That's why it may be useful to look at this passage of uh, Philippians 2 again, those verses 12 to 16 that, that Gary kindly read for us. Let's just think about them for a moment again. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in your absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. And here's the lovely bit. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. 
God saves us and takes us as we are. We are all sinners saved by grace. But that's not how he leaves us. He loves us too much to leave us that way, as Jason has expressed to us on many occasions. He loves us so much, either until we are called home or till the Lord Jesus returns, by his spirit he works in us and on us to make us more like the Lord Jesus. For folks like me, believe me, that is a lifelong process. It's called sanctification. He sanctifies or purifies us in this lifelong process process of sanctification as it says there in verse 13 for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill his good purpose and in verse 15 again so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped generation Before we continue and go on to look at what our responsibility is in this process, for we do have one, let me encourage everyone by reading us the most precious verse from the first chapter of Philippians that should constantly encourage and thrill our hearts. I know it does mine. And it's that verse in chapter 1, verse 6, as Paul writes, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Once he has saved us, he will never let us go and he will continue to guide, protect, help, comfort and encourage us in our walk with him, conforming us to the likeness of his son. Until that day when he will be able, God willing, to say to us, Come in, good and faithful servant. But we do bear some responsibility in this. And there will be consequences to our response to him. That is why Paul writes in the second half of verse 12, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let's think about this for a moment to get a correct perspective on this. At the beginning of verse 12, Paul refers to their ongoing obedience there, whether he is with them and observing them or not. Well, I think it's right to draw the analogy and remind ourselves that we worship an all-knowing and all-seeing God. So we should conduct ourselves in that light. We should want to live in the light of not wanting to grieve a holy God. Live with a proper reverent fear, and so to please our utterly holy God, that we would want to conduct ourselves in a manner to please him and grow in our relationship of love with him. So our heart motivation to will and to act should be to live in the light of our magnificent salvation and to have a God-given Desire to be purified and sanctified by him and desiring to grow more like Jesus. The outcome of this expressed in the second half of verse 15 is that wonderful line, isn't it? So we can shine among them like stars. So the question is, what is the practical outworking in this passage that enables us to shine like stars. Well, first of all, A, it's there in verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. That is, bearing with one another and living humbly, encouraging one another in this, our community of Grimsby Baptist Church. Just reminds me there of John 13, 35. You know, by all this, men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Secondly, B, In verse 15, be blameless and pure. Not, as we have seen, absolute sinless perfection, but a devotion to responding to the will of God. And C, as verse 16, holding firmly to the word of life. 
going back to studying, meditating on the Word of God, the Bible, and holding on to the truths of the gospel, feeding our minds that changes our hearts. Doing these things is always a response of our heart's desire. As we go back for a moment and think about that beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We could think about this in two parts, our salvation and our sanctification. So let's just think about those for a second or two. In our salvation, for those who know and love Jesus, we could think about it in the encouragement that we are given in Revelation 22, verses 4 and 5. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. He, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This verse being written in the context of a new heaven and a new earth, following the return of Jesus. But what about the day-to-day in the terms of our daily walk? Well, there's a really obvious one, in a sense, of what are we exposing our hearts to? What are we looking at? Who are we mixing with? And what are we getting involved with? We really have to guard our hearts. Jesus says this, recording in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 9. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. This is Jesus that he's saying that sin and exposure to sin is serious and requires dealing with with a radical way. Don't be walking into wrong situations. Don't be doing the wrong thing. Don't be looking at things you shouldn't. Deal with it now and deal with it seriously. That's what the Lord Jesus is saying when he says those things. John Owen, the Puritan, wrote a great little book on the subject called Mortification of Sin. And mortification just means putting to death or killing. He wrote this. Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. So let's just go back to our beatitude and the word used there in pure, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, the word Greek word for pure here has this idea of milk or wine that has not been adulterated with water, watered down, or a metal that has not any tinge of alloy in it. So the basic meaning here for pure is unmixed, unadulterated, like pure gold. I find this a real challenge, I have to say. It's a real challenge for us because it demands us to self-examine our heart motives in the most exacting manner. See, within our fellowship, is our work done from motives of service or some reward or adulation? Is it from selflessness or self-display? Is our church going? An attempt to meet God or a tick box on the guarantee eternity form? What is our prayer and Bible reading time like, our quiet times? Is it a genuine desire to be in the company of God? Or does it make, it feel, make us feel superior at doing better than someone else? Or even worse, do we see others doing seemingly better than us and feel inferior or down? I heard a sermon not too long ago where the preacher stated we may all be surprised who we live, who we will see in heaven and who we don't. Some will be there who we don't expect and some will not be there who we would expect because the outward display with the wrong motives is an offence to God. We first have to guard our own hearts. To examine our own motives is a very daunting and challenging thing. As I said, preparing this, it really does challenge you. Because I think the reason is 
I suspect that few of us do things with completely unmixed motives. Jesus goes on to say, only the pure heart will see God. Well, let's just think about that as we finish. When we do not guard our hearts and when we do not immediately kill that first seed of sinful desire, and as it grows, in effect, we start to step away from God. He remains unchanged. And in his grace, his hand is still held out for us to return and be picked up and be restored. In a sense, it's that point where we start to hide from God, just like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And we see him less clearly. That unpure heart dirties or obscures the lens through which we see God. And quite frankly, when we do that, It doesn't make us feel any better, does it? I know that happens to me and I feel worse until focus and coming back to God. And we have to remember by his love, grace and mercy, how does he always see us? And the power of his spirit living on us, let us look to him, study his word and respond to the truth of the gospel. Build our loving relationship with him and with each other. Not doing things to look good in front of others. Let's build our relationship with him and in a sense know him better. Be like the astronomer who studies the stars and, and knows them all by name. Be like the navigator who by knowing the night sky can bring his ship home through a barren and featureless sea to a safe haven. Or be the trained botanist, where we would see a tang- looking at a tangle of weeds and plants. That trained botanist can spot and see something of infinite value and rarity because we have eyes to see. Therefore, my dear friends, As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then... You will shine like stars in the skies among them as you shine like stars in the skies as you hold firmly to the word of life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. We're going to stand and the band will lead us as we finish together. We're going to sing, purify my heart, cleanse me from within, and make me holy, set apart, ready to do God's will.
I'd like us to finish with uh, the end of Philippians, where Paul writes these words towards the conclusion. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen. Practice these things and the God of peace be with you. Amen. Have a blessed week.